go. Folks, as you are joining us, we're just going to give a chance for our uh, other attendees to uh, log on, and then we will get started in just a minute or two. All right, good evening, folks. It is uh, six o'clock, so we will get started. It looks like our uh, attendees joining us are starting to slow down, so we will get right into it. And um, I am Tom Brinley, and I uh, proudly serve as the superintendent in the, the district here. So I just want to quickly introduce you to our other panelists. Uh, I know, and I will introduce them as they appear on my screen. Uh, Colleen Moore is our director of curriculum and instruction. Mr. Tim Gracie is our Director of Special Education. We have Colleen Cashman, who is a board member. We have uh, Tom Molay, who is the principal of the Oneana Middle School. We have Bonnie Nobling, who serves as our Director of Information Technology Services. We have Mr. Bill Grau, who is the president of our Board of Education. We have Jamie Reynolds, who is uh, also a board member. And we have Mrs. Sue Kurkowski, who is a board member as well. So I can't uh, thank you enough for uh, taking some time out of your busy evening to spend with us as we uh, dis discuss our plan for reopening. Uh, this is the second of our parent forums. And uh, you know, as, as many of you uh, are experiencing, you have children maybe in the K-5 environment, the 6-8 environment, and, and maybe even the 9-12 environment as well. And, um, this presentation is, is, uh, uh, is appropriate for all three levels. So if you have uh, children at the 9-12 level as well, you are certainly welcome to tune in again on Thursday night at six o'clock. Um, and uh, just to share with you what we were, uh, what we're planning for this evening. Um, you know, we have a, a brief PowerPoint presentation and uh, just to simply share where we are in, in terms of our reopening for the 2021 school year. We have some questions and answer slides. These are questions that have uh, been previously submitted and posed to me, so I put them uh, in the presentation. And then an opportunity for uh, you all to share uh, any questions that you might have. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen. There is a Q&A um, section right next to participants. If you click on that, you can type a question and that will uh, come into us. And Mrs. Moore is serving as our moderator this evening. And when we get to that point in the presentation, we will try and, uh, uh, try and get to all of those questions uh, at the end. And, and anything that we don't get, we will uh, we will address and put out there on our website. But um, you know, last Thursday's presentation, we were uh, we were able to get to most uh, every all questions. So um, again, I appreciate you being here. And uh, even if you don't want to pose a question in the question and answer uh, or the, the Q and A section, you can always feel free to email me uh, or call me, and I will gladly. Uh, uh, answer those questions uh, to you over the phone or via email. So, all right, so we will get into it. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to begin by just sharing uh, 
essentially the impact that Governor Cuomo's announcement on August 7th had on schools throughout New York State. His announcement simply meant that schools may reopen for in-person instruction. Uh, however, the format in which schools reopen has been left up to uh, individual districts. Um, and honestly, uh, I, I get it, but I, I've said this before and shared with you all in, in uh, a letter that I had sent to you previously, a uh, very difficult situation for school district leaders to be in. Uh, these decisions not only have health and safety implications, but also family finance uh, implications as well. So um, very difficult. And, um, you know, but I, I hope you know that these decisions uh, are absolutely being made with the uh, health and safety of our students, our faculty, our staff, and our general community in mind. Um, interestingly enough, as you know, some districts can are small enough that they can reopen for in-person instruction uh, because they can simply accommodate their uh, class classes um, without any modifications at all uh, in terms of physical distancing um, and, and those kinds of situations. It, for us here in Oneonta and the BOCES that we um, belong to, it's very difficult for Oneonta uh, simply by its sheer size. There are not uh, any other districts that, um, you know, encounter the challenges that we face um, you know, relative to our student population. So uh, it's been very, very difficult to, um, you know, and as such, I've had to rely on, on lots of other uh, different uh, cohorts of folks that I've reached out to. So I want to share with you the factors that played into this decision to open remotely. Since even before our closure on March 13th, um, there were uh, many meetings that I attended with the Otsego County Department of Health um, who have truly been a good partner for us. Um, we had some concerns related to folks traveling last February uh, as this uh, virus was really, um, you know, taking hold in not only Asia but in Europe as well. So we worked very, very closely with uh, the Otsego Department of uh, Health Many of those meetings that I attended also included representation from the Delaware County Department of Health and the Greene County Department of Health. Um, I also am fortunate to serve on the Fox Hospital Board where I have been privy to um, a lot of data and information that has uh, truly informed our decision as well. Uh, I also uh, proudly serve on the Hartwood College President's Advisory Panel along with the mayor of the city of Oneonta, college officials, hospital officials, local business leaders. And those have proven to be um, very informative as well. Uh, as you can ima imagine, many, many meetings with our faculty and staff, our board of education, our new transportation providers, Durham Transportation Services, Chartwells, they provide our uh, contractual food service your parent surveys were uh, very important, um, certainly to me. Uh, our school attorneys, it seems like daily, uh, really since March 17th, I have participated in Zoom meetings with other superintendents from the Otsego Northern Catskill BOCES, and many interactions with superintendents from Central and Western New York. Uh, because those are the districts that I reached out to who are of comparable size to Oneonta, um, just to see how they were doing things. But besides them, I have also reached out to many superintendents in, uh, who serve in college communities around New York State. So as you can see, there was a lot of, um, a, a lot of, a lot of information that weighed into uh, this decision to open remotely. If I may, before the next slide, Mr. Brindley, I just wanted to let people know that if you raise your hand, we won't be able to um, call on you. So if you have a question or need something, please put it in the question and answer box. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Colleen. You know, all of those hours of um, spending uh, meeting and listening and reading, uh, these are some things that I learned, that each and every community is, is unique. Uh, many will not be informing their fa families of their specific reopening format until about the third week of August, which was problematic to me. Um, we shared this decision with you all even before the governor's announcement, uh, because unless the governor said, you know, we all have to go back to school in person, our plan would not have changed. Um, and uh, knowing that that was highly unlikely, we, we tried to give you as parents and guardians and, and our students and, and our faculty and staff members as much time as possible um, to prepare for this remote reopening. And the last thing that I learned is that there are no good choices related to reopening schools. This is just a, a terrible situation that we're all in. So very much was hoping that, um, you know, there'd be some sort of breakthrough that over the summer that would make us feel more comfortable about reopening our schools uh, as we can see uh, some of the places that are happening, uh, some of the things that are happening around our country relative to reopening schools. Um, it really is a gamble. I, I will share with you that yesterday I was contacted by both CNN and the New York Times who were looking for a story uh, about some, some concerns related to our football team and our band, uh, only to find out that they were looking to speak with uh, the superintendent from uh, Oneonta, Alabama. So poor Oneonta, Alabama is experiencing some uh, COVID-19 related concerns among their football and their band. So uh, many, many students are currently quarantined down in Oneonta, or Alabama. Thank you, Colleen. All right, now the, the list of what we don't know is, is um, these are the things that are problematic. We, we really don't quite know the full impact that a large influx of our college students will have on the collective health of our community. Um, if, if you happen to be monitoring any of the uh, testing that is taking place, uh, there has been an uptick in uh, testing. You know, I know one day last week, uh, on average, Otsego County is, is testing roughly 130 to 170 folks a day and, and one day last week they tested about 432 and then 271. Um, I know some of the numbers that came in today are, are or yesterday are over 200 and uh, you know unfortunately um, many of those test results won't come back for uh, on average about five to, to ten days and now I heard today uh, from a meeting that uh, sometimes those results are not coming back for 12 to 14 days uh, which is problematic for students that might be out or even faculty members that might be out and need to get back in. So we made our remote learning announcement as early as possible, as I had mentioned before, just hoping that it would provide some sort of help for our parents and guardians. And believe me, I know that it doesn't. We know that this is just so difficult for, um, for our parents and guardians. It's, it's really kind of it's difficult all the way around. Um, but we're going to try and make it as manageable as possible in the hopes that we can just get back into our buildings and back to, uh, you know, what we, what we do. The, the second thing, obviously, that we don't know is, uh, you know, asymptomatic cases and, and, and the lack of the ability to detect positive cases in our schools. This was one of those things that was very interesting to me, especially when we had representation from the different uh, departments of health. You know, we had one uh, person in attendance at that meeting saying that our school nurses will simply know. They'll know that if, it, if it's this symptom or this, that symptom that, uh, and, and obviously that didn't go very well because the other folks from the other two departments of health were like, wait a second, time out. That's not how this is gonna work. You know, if you look at the list of symptoms, you know, if someone had that ability to tell you know, they wouldn't be a school nurse. They would be, you know, standing in front of some line right now, uh, you know, trying to assess the health of, of folks. So that's what's problematic because, you know, look, even October, 
and and as parents you know about three weeks into any school year our children even our faculty and staff you know three weeks in we're, we're almost all of us are almost symptomatic at that point um you know and then with the onset of of the fall we have allergies uh seasonal allergies um it's going to be very very difficult but right now guidance is advising us that we have to treat them all the same um, which is uh, which is which is difficult and lastly the impact of quarantine and contact tracing on a family if someone is, sus is suspected of this illness now this is still being discussed but right now the way that I'm understanding this is you know uh, if your child is sent home with COVID symptoms and uh, you know, as part of our method of operation, we have to reach out to the Department of Health. The Department of Health may impose a quarantine, and I could be wrong, but this is the way that I, I understand this. They could impose a quarantine on, on the household. Um, and when I heard that, I was, uh, I was a bit shocked, but I don't know if I should be. But that's certainly problematic, um, you know, from, from a family perspective. So what do we know? We are working hard to create a remote learning environment that is engaging. We recognize that we need to take what we tried to implement March through June and just do it a hundred times better. Um, you know, last March, uh, not, not to go back, because I think I've included this in a letter as well to you all, but that March 13th, I participated in a meeting with the Department of Health, uh, law enforcement, the fire service, um, our colleges, uh, some healthcare professionals. And I left that meeting based on what the Department of Health had told us was that right now it's business as usual. Uh, if you recall, there might have been only one confirmed case in Delaware County at the time and I left that meeting at almost 2 p.m. that afternoon. And I came back to the district here. We had a quick um, uh, district office staff meeting. I shared the findings for the day. And at 4.36 p.m., only two and a half hours later, all of the superintendents in Otsego and Schoharie County received an email uh, from their respective departments of health that we were to close, uh, which was kind of a shock uh, for us all, as I'm sure it was for uh, our students and our families as well. Um, so we recognize that, uh, you know, we, we closed and we absolutely did the best we could under those circumstances. We really scrambled to try and, and help our families connect to the best of their ability. Uh, we tried to work with our um, faculty and staff members who might have had some connectivity concerns. Um, but we absolutely recognize the shortcomings of, of, um, of that time period. So we are working hard to um, put together a different product, um, a more structured product that we will get into in just a minute. But uh, we are working to create, you know, this environment that has built-in support opportunities, not only for our students, but uh, your family as well, whether it be academic, whether it be technology-based, whether it be social and emotional. And we are excited uh, to welcome our students and you all and our faculty and staff back for this school year, even in the remote learning environment, uh, which we know uh, is, uh, is not great, but we also are optimistic that at some point, we're gonna be back in our brick and mortar buildings and um, in some capacity and you know really try and make this as memorable of a year as possible. So September 8th through uh, October 9th, um, this is what we are planning. So remote learning for all and what will that look like? A more structured approach than as, as I said March through June. Only one learning management system for consistency K through 12 Listen, of, of the many things that I heard from uh, our parents and our students, 
was that balancing between Schoology and Google Classroom was problematic for a number of reasons. And uh, we heard that loud and clear. The last thing that we wanted to do was to uh, create any degree of, um, you know, disruption in your homes. Uh, and again, I can't thank you all enough for what you did during that period and what you will do during this one. Uh, I feel very, very fortunate that, um, you know, to live and work in this community because uh, we have great, great parents and great faculty and staff and supportive board. Um, and and we're, we're lucky because we have great students as well. So um, students will have a daily schedule and we're going to be mindful that, um, you know, that that was another thing that you had mentioned that you know, kids needed some some degree of structure, and we're gonna we're gonna provide that. But we're also gonna build in there the flexibility that we believe, um, you know, your children and uh, and you as parents and our uh, teachers need. Uh, it's very difficult to replicate, you know, what happens in our brick and mortar buildings in the remote format, but we're gonna try and do the best we can. So. Um, you know, if you, if you take for a, a, a minute the master schedule uh, at the 6 through 12 level or 6 through 8 level here, um, and with a nine period day, you know that those periods are, are 41 minutes long. So we're going to create a, a virtual schedule that mimics uh, their um, in-person schedule, but just because it's scheduled for 41 minutes does not mean that your children are going to be online every single one of those minutes all throughout the day. So that 41 minutes does not represent the amount of time that your, your child or your children are going to be online. We recognize um, the concerns relative to screen time. So, for example, depending on the lesson at objective, the synchronous portion, the live portion, may be this concise um, instructional opportunity. Uh, so their synchronous session may actually be shorter than the full period. And, um, you know, this way, they, it's almost like a flipped classroom environment in, in some regards. Our students are going to learn something. They're going to be given an opportunity to um, put those skills in motion uh, that they don't need to be, you know, looking at a screen for. Uh, yet our uh, teachers are still going to be accessible if uh, a question pops up or concern. We will be taking attendance daily and, and I have some uh, uh, questions that I'm sure will arise from that and student work is going to be graded. One of the other things that we truly heard from you uh, March through June was that with the work not being graded, uh, students just didn't find any meaning to it and we get that and you know, us uh, taking that approach was, was important for us because we recognized that, you know, not all students in the remote learning environment um, are going to have the opportunity to, you know, uh, sit in front of a computer. You know, many of our students, uh, even in this age bracket, were responsible for caring for their si younger siblings as, as mom or mom and dad, you know, how to go to work. So we just felt that it would be, we'd be penalizing our students if we held them uh, accountable for that work at that time. Um, everything was very, very fluid. Uh, so it was just, but, but that is not going to be the, the, the case here. Uh, the mean structure and the uh, work assigned is going to be meaningful. It's going to be new instruction. Um, so here's the question that I know we're all asking. What if, for some reason, my child cannot Zoom on a given day? Will his or her attendance or grade be adversely affected? Now, this is what we truly need. Um, and, and you are all so good at this. But we just need open, continued open communication, uh, it said, should say, with your child's teacher or building administrator. Um, because you just need to sh share with us that you know, your, your child, we don't necessarily even need to know uh, exactly why. We just need to know that your child is not going to be there 
uh, at that particular time. And in most cases, there's going to be something, whether it be an exit ticket or something of, um, you know, a brief assignment that they may submit later in the day that uh, will, um, you know, a account for attendance. So our, our mission here is not to play gotcha with your children in any sense uh, of, of that word. Our mission here is to help your children uh, navigate through this incredibly difficult time. So we just need to know how you're feeling. I will tell you that after June, uh, you know, some parents would reach out to me and, and say that, you know, this was problematic or that was problematic. And they didn't want to bother our teachers or our building administrators because everything really was just, you know, uh, so crazy at that time. But in this particular case, if, if you need something or you don't feel like your child is getting what he or she needs, I'm encouraging you to reach out to your child's teacher um, because your, your child's teacher does needs to know that um, so so we we hope you do that but we absolutely realize that uh, there will be times or days when it's going to be difficult um, for your children to be on and I'm just letting you know that we're going to be uh, flexible and understanding and as accommodating as we can be uh, to help you as families and our children Now, through our parent survey, uh, the most recent one, um, we've learned that a few of our families have uh, connectivity issues. So, um, and I know our building administrator is already working with families on this, as well as Bonnie Nobling, our director of IT services, uh, as we have ordered um, <laughs> Wi-Fi hotspots. And um, just so you know, Chromebook and material distribution schedule is already on our website. So um, and as in our, go ahead, Colleen, but even our textbooks, one of the things that you had all shared, and it's the bottom bullet here, um, based on last year's concerns was that, you know, Chromebooks are fine, but you also need textbooks as supplemental. Uh, and, and those will be disseminated at our scheduled material distribution date as well. So in the learning environment, as we mentioned, uh, the day will be scheduled. So there's gonna be daily live interaction with, with faculty. Again, the state has, uh, again, made it difficult for us by, um, not difficult, but has established that we need to maintain substantial teacher interaction. And um, therefore that's reflected in our, in our daily schedule um, of course, that's all tied into state aid, which uh, they have indicated that they're going to pay close attention to. Um, but we've got it covered with our schedule. We're going to be just fine. But mixed in with that daily live interaction, we're going to have some recorded lessons that are going to be uploaded uh, for our students and our parents and guardians to access later in the day. One of the concerns that we had received was that at 11 o'clock, the Chromebooks stop working. Um, and we did that purposefully because we, um, and I don't think you would want this as well, you know, children online after 11 p.m. Um, so they will uh, continue to, you know, turn off at 11. And I don't think you all want to be um, doing schoolwork at 11 o'clock at night uh, either. But uh, assignments are going to be posted for uh, student and parent guardian access as well. We're going to blend in their non-digital resources uh, and they'll, they'll uh, also play an important role in the remote learning environment. Uh, and again, our, the textbooks will be uh, handed out at our material distribution date. Again, listening to you all and to our students, um, access to help was, was a concern. So just want to let you know that we're currently building opportunities for uh, you all to receive academic and or technical assistance. We're creating tutorials on our website to guide you through uh, some technical challenges that you, you may have faced in the spring. Uh, we're putting together some parent guardian small group um, 
technology support opportunities. And we're currently exploring how and if we might be able to mobilize some virtual student tutors. Uh, these are folks who, you know, may be uh, some of our upperclassmen who uh, will avail themselves to um, students at any grade level that they can reach out to and uh, help if they need it. So all of those things, you know, once we have uh, one or more or all of them up and running, we will reach out to you and, and share where you can find those resources. Uh, Bonnie Nobling has put together a wonderful um, parent resource on our website. So we will uh, continue to add to those things. And if you have a chance, if you could visit there and, and um, see what's there, but we're gonna continue to uh, add to that spot on our website as well. All right, so September 8th through October 9th, this is just a continuation because I know many of uh, us are wondering about athletics which, is, uh, which do play an important role in the six through eight environment. Um, as of right now, as you may be aware, the New York State Public High School Athletic Association has delayed the start of sports uh, at least until September 21st. So uh, we are waiting on them. They are the governing body of athletics in New York State. And um, you know, if, we, if anything changes, we will communicate that uh, to you as well, but if not, if, if that remains the same, um, we're hoping to, to make these athletic opportunities available for our students. Um, at least we're hoping that that will, look, we say this all the time, that you know, kids, will, kids need to feel connected to their schools uh, in order to um, you know, be comfortable and, and wanna participate and wanna do well. And uh, we're gonna try and continue to do that even in a, re in a remote environment. And that brings me to clubs. We're going to try and, and offer these to our students as well. There may be some that clearly will not work in the virtual environment, but those that can, we're going to try and run them and, um, you know, have our students engage in those conversations and those meetings online with their advisors. And um, so more to come on that. In terms of meals, um, we're going to operate the same as we did March through June. And we received something from the state um, recently that I'm uh, putting together a letter for you all. Um, I, it appears as though uh, we're gonna have to prepay for lunches uh, again in this environment. Um, March through June, we, we didn't have to, but um, you know, the state clearly has made that change. So there will be a letter coming with that, that explains that uh, to you all. We also wanted to share with you that the Regional Food Bank, um, and we've been partnering with them this summer, uh, is going to be distributing food again at the Oneonta Middle School parking lot uh, starting at um, 10 a.m. on August 31st and then again on September 30th. So uh, you come right down to the S-curves just like you would if you were dropping your your child off, you go to the, uh, right down the S-curves at the football field, you, you stick to the right and you go into the middle school parking lot. Um, so please spread that word to anyone you uh, know might be um, in need of, uh, of some of that. The Regional Food Bank is a, is a great organization and we're lucky that we have them here and uh, hopefully we can partner with them uh, throughout this. And then, uh, you know, in terms of BOCES programs, right now they're trying to figure out what programs they can accommodate on their campus, uh, fully in person, those that might have to be a hybrid approach and those that might be remote based on numbers. So uh, again, our plan is to uh, send our BOCES students if their programs are running. We will uh, provide transportation, um, but more to come on that as well as, uh, as BOCES shares with us what their, what their plans are. So the big question is, you know, as we head toward uh, our transition to a hybrid model, and first I just wanna share with you why a hybrid, and uh, it just goes back to our sheer numbers. Um, on average, our cl classrooms are roughly 730 square feet. 
So we cannot accommodate, and this is, this is another reason why your parent surveys were so beneficial uh, for us, because we were able to really kind of get a ballpark figure um, in terms of who is going to be um, learning remotely, uh, at least through, uh, maybe even through this medical emergency, who might be looking to uh, come back in a hybrid situation. And those numbers were very, very important because what it showed us is that clearly uh, when we do transition to some sort of in-person environment, that it is gonna have to be in the hybrid format. Uh, this way we can physically distance our students safely. Um, but anyway, the, the, in terms of factors, of course, it has to do with the number of students who elect to be taught remotely or are ill. Uh, clearly, we need to monitor the collective health of our community. We need to monitor the number of staff members who request to work remotely due to chronic illness and comorbidities or those who are caring for family members uh, in that category. And this is in the hybrid format. Um, of course, we need to continue to work very closely with uh, our departments uh, of health, both our county and state department of health. And of course, the governor could always um, extend some sort of executive order closing schools as he has. Uh, of course, we are hearing the, the, the fear of a second wave. Um, so we're gonna have to monitor all of that. But the other factors you know, that we need to consider, one is the ability to test students and receive timely test results. And uh, I think I was sharing at the last meeting that I had attended with uh, our healthcare community the concern is that many of the reagents that are used for testing specimens are, are essentially uh, heading elsewhere around the, the country that uh, seems to be in more need. Uh, unfortunately, what that results in is the fact that uh, testing can't be done on a local level uh, in large scale. As such, it's being shipped up to the Wadsworth lab and uh, the Wadsworth lab is doing the best they can, but they are overburdened as well, resulting in many of those specimens being frozen and then uh, tested or, or processed later on. The downside to all of that is that the test results, as I had mentioned before, are coming back you know, between on average five to 10 days. Um, so we're gonna have to monitor all of that. Uh, of course, we're gonna have to monitor the closure of any other schools or programs that we rely on for um, particular services, like our BOCES programs, the uh, ability to acquire enough cleaning products and personal protective equipment. I don't know if you were seeing this, but um, the state has uh, put it out there that um, hospitals need to carry about 60 days worth of supply of these items. Therefore, as you can imagine, it's, it's pretty difficult um, for us to acquire any of these products in any large scale capacity. We also need the ability to acquire adequate food supplies from our vendors right now and all through March through June. Um, you know, food supply was, was healthy and we're gonna uh, hope that that continues. And then we need the ability to acquire and maintain substitutes uh, substitute teachers and bus drivers. Um, the reality of the situation is that many of these folks are often retired and, um, you know, may or, or may not have uh, some underlying health conditions. We have pulled our current substitute pool, and I can tell you that um, there is uh, some, some real concern on their part about returning in person. Uh, so that would could be problematic. And I wanna share an example of, of why that might be. We know for sure that uh, some of our teachers uh, do have some underlying conditions that uh, you know, have or will be seeking the uh, accommodation of working remotely when we are back open in some capacity, uh, in particular the hybrid fashion. So we will have a teacher working at home. However, uh, we're gonna have students sitting in that teacher's classroom 
on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. So uh, they can't be sitting there without some sort of uh, supervision or monitoring. So we are gonna have to uh, scramble to try and uh, acquire enough folks to serve in that capacity while our teachers are, are working from home. Um, so th these are all, there's, there's a lot here and, and this list is not exhaustive, but um, there's a lot of things that will go into that decision and I will tell you, I will continue to um, monitor the situation very, very closely and continue to work with our community partners uh, and, and our county partners uh, to make sure that uh, the decisions that we make are um, truly what is, um, you know, the safest at the time. Thank you, Colleen. Special education services. Uh, I know uh, we, we've received many, many uh, questions about how special education is going to uh, work this year. And uh, Mr. Gracie has been doing a great job working with the special education department. But just so you know, at the beginning of this school year, you are gonna be contacted by the uh, teacher or therapist that works with your child. And they're doing that so they can listen to you and they can listen to your children, um, basically to, to hear the concerns that you have experienced during that closure. Um, and those will be important conversations to have. Um, again, there may be goals that were developed that need to be updated or revisited. Um, you know, and during that discussion, they're gonna be inquiring about your preference to how services will be implemented. Uh, so those, these conversations are going to be uh, very, very important as they will inform our special education department so they, they can work with your child um, in, in a more productive manner. So as you know, during that first five weeks, we're gonna be in the virtual environment. Um, but again, we heard you, we even heard, we heard our kids too, that some degree of structure uh, is important for them and um, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a, a daily schedule for our kids. So as you can see, you know, for self-contained classrooms, uh, you know, the goal obviously is to limit any ex exposure um, and student mainstreaming opportunities uh, may be modified when in-person classes resume. Our resource rooms and, and classroom te consultant teacher services will be scheduled and implemented similar to how they are during the, the regular school day. Um, and as we determine how many students with disabilities are returning to school on uh, Tuesday, October 13th, more details are gonna be coming your way. Um, so again, some of that stuff is, will be posted in our parent resource center. Um, or again, you know, as I mentioned, folks are gonna be reaching out to you directly. And as always, please feel free to reach out to the special education office uh, or your respective building principal with questions that may be unique to your child. So what will a hybrid model look like? And I know I alluded to this before, but, um, and some of the details still need to be finalized. Uh, as you can imagine, there are some uh, con contractual implications here and working with our teachers association has been, um, you know, really, really easy. Uh, they're very, very supportive. So um, in order to maintain that appropriate physical distancing, as I'd mentioned before, uh, we are going to have to divide our students uh, into two hybrid groups. Uh, one group is going to attend on Monday and Tuesday with remote learning Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The second group uh, will attend on Thursday and Friday with remote learning on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Group three is essentially our um, students who are working with the special education department. Uh, and group four are those students that are gonna remain uh, in remote learning, uh, possibly throughout the full duration of um, this medical and health emergency. So some of our students, we don't feel are going to be back until um, long after October passes, uh, because that's what's uh, safe for them. That's where their families want them. Uh, and we completely understand that. Interestingly enough, many districts have not even given their parents a choice in this, uh, which uh, 
we find incredibly problematic. Um, and that's not us. As you know, your surveys were um, contributed much to this plan and uh, we recognize the concerns that you have and we're going to do our best to um, you know provide what you need and what your children need in that remote setting for however long uh, they are comfortable or need to remain there. Uh, when will we know what hybrid group uh, my child or children will be assigned to? Well pr pretty soon. Um, we need to just conduct confirmations. Again your parent survey uh, was very, very helpful, but uh, there may be another uh, time when we reach out to you just to say, this is what you shared with us. Um, can you please confirm this? There is also um, a large group of folks who didn't respond to our survey that we're going to need to reach out to as well and just um, see where they are on the situation so we can account for them as well. Once we have those names in place, we're going to be able to level load our students into the hybrid groups. We are going to absolutely do our very best to make sure that uh, all of your children are attending uh, on the same days. Uh, so we know, we hope that that will make it easier for you as parents. And um, again, once that, once those lists come out, if we have missed something, you just simply need to, uh, you know, call into your building administrator and we will, uh, we will make that change. But this could be in late August. Uh, and then we're gonna get that information out to you as quickly as, as we can. Transportation, and again, going back to your surveys, <clears throat> many of you have indicated that under these circumstances, you are more comfortable transporting your child or your children. And we certainly appreciate that because trying to physically distance students on our school buses um, is, well, that's not the difficult part, but trying to get all of our students to school on time uh, in a physically distanced format is, is gonna be a challenge for us. So we really wanna appreciate anyone who might be able to uh, ch transport your child to and from school uh, when we do open. Um, we are not going to do this, but many districts have expanded the walking range to reduce ridership uh, on their buses. And uh, again, we, we don't wanna do this. We would rather simply just ask uh, if you could uh, transport your, your, your child. And once we do have those numbers in place, we're gonna be placing students on our buses with masks, one student to a seat. Our buses have the, um, the, the high backed seats, which um, you know, serve as a uh, barrier so we can, uh, we can place one, one child per seat. And um, you know, as, as Durham uh, transportation takes over, uh, they are looking forward to transporting our children uh, on time and safely to school each and every day and, and home from school. All right, so morning health screening. Um, and this is taken, much of this is taken right from that uh, 99 page framework that we've posted online that I submitted to the state, but um, morning health screenings, you know, we had purchased eight uh, thermal scanning uh, thermometers that we're going to place in the uh, main entrance of our buildings. And of course, we purchased those prior to that guidance coming out. But uh, the state um, is hoping that these health screenings can take place at home before you send your child to the bus stop or uh, drop them off in person or uh, those that walk to school. So we are working to acquire Parent Square, which is an app that can be used to affirm that the screening has taken place. And um, there will also be a, a non-tech option as well. So as, as mentioned uh, elsewhere, and I'm, I'm sure you probably have all heard this, if your child has a fever above 100 degrees, uh, and the answer, uh, if, if your child does not have a fever of uh, 100 degrees, and the answer is no to those following questions, you know, send, send your child to school. Um, but if the answer is yes to any of those questions, uh, we are asking that you please keep your child home from school. Um, and uh, as I mentioned on the bottom there, um, 
you know, if yes to any question, no member of the household may attend school. And before returning to school, all students in the household must have documentation from a healthcare provider evaluation, a negative COVID-19 test, and a symptom resolution, or if COVID-19 is positive, um, a, a release from isolation. So, you know, this is where it gets difficult uh, in the um, in-person environment, because unfortunately, again, we're really not gonna know the results of, um, you know, is, is, is this mild fever and a uh, stuffy nose COVID? Is it just uh, some sort of seasonal allergy uh, implication? Uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a challenge, but we will get through it together for sure. So what happens if your child is symptomatic at school? Uh, we will create isolation rooms. I'm sure you've probably heard about these. Um, you know, we, you bring your child there. Our school nurse will um, assess the symptoms. If they're consistent with COVID, uh, school nurse is gonna call the main office. And um, if, if that student has other um, siblings in the building uh, or in school, they're all gonna have to go home uh, and uh, we're going to provide our parents and our guardians with you know, any information on healthcare or testing resources uh, if, if you need it um, to help you in those situations. Before returning to school, the students or students must have documentation, as I just mentioned, from a healthcare provider evaluation and negative COVID testing um, and, and a degree of symptom resolution. In our classrooms and hallways, lunch, and recess, uh, you know, students will wear masks and be physically distanced in our classrooms. We are absolutely going to provide mask breaks uh, that will be offered throughout the day where we, um, you know, our teachers will, you know, take students and, uh, to an area where they can really spread out and remove their masks for a few minutes and uh, um, hopefully get uh, you know, a little break from that experience and then get back into the classroom. Um, so even the physically distanced classrooms, we're gonna, we're gonna wear our masks uh, at all times. Students and staff will wear masks in the hallways. What happens if someone's not wearing a mask? Well, it's gonna be a gentle reminder um, that they need to, to wear their masks. And we know that's gonna be a challenge. Um, they're uncomfortable, they're hot. Uh, we, we all get that, but um, you know, we're hoping that our, our folks in the building feel comfortable knowing that those around them wear, wear masks. Um, lunches will be pre-ordered and, and prepared and provided in areas designated to physically distance our students. And again, more to come on that. I'll send that letter out to you soon. Um, you know, as part of uh, the middle school lunch, there is a degree of, of recess. Uh, in conjunction with that. And um, we're gonna do our, our best to make sure that students are physically distanced 12 feet in that environment. You know, as you know, the 12 feet recommendation is um, what the CDC uh, has suggested for physical education and for, um, for instrumental music and uh, chorus. So uh, that's what the classrooms and the hallways in, in our lunch periods will look like. So these are some questions in, in uh, the answers that I've provided um, that folks have sent in. I, I know some of these I've already shared. Will transportation of BOCES provided? Absolutely. Uh, are there specs on face masks? Well, there are. An appropriate face mask is one, and, and, it, and it's changing all the time, uh, but an appropriate face mask is one in which both the mouth and nose are covered. Gator style face coverings, bandanas and masks with, with valves are considered uh, less effective uh, and should not be used in school. Uh, we also know that polyester face masks hold moisture um, and that may be uncomfortable and uh, probably best if they weren't used as well. Important question here, if the governor's reopening metrics are met as we approach October, will we reopen? Well, our communication and collaboration with our Department of Health is gonna continue uh, there's a lot to consider here, more than just a number. 
So the 5% to 9% range uh, established by the governor could and would create some concerns in this region based on my conversations with the Otsego County Department of Health. So we're gonna just have to monitor that closely um, as well as all the other factors that I previously mentioned here. So um, there's a lot of plates in the air when it comes to that, but you know, as we always do, we're gonna give it our full attention and we're gonna uh, keep our eyes on it. We're gonna keep talking and listening and reading and um, you know, do our best to provide a, an environment that's safe for all of us, including you at home. So um, we're gonna do our best to try and keep you know, things from being uh, you know, carried home. I, I, I don't know if you've all been uh, aware of this Camp X that's down in Georgia. It's a sleepaway camp um, that has proven to be very concerning in the, uh, in the medical world. You know, there seem to be some degree of understanding relative to uh, how uh, younger kids contract and how they shed this illness. And, you know, the 500 and some odd folks that arrived at this camp in Georgia um, were negative. And, uh, you know, at one point there was over 220 kids and staffers that tested positive for COVID. So, um, you know, there's just a lot to think about. Uh, again, I know we're seeing many schools close already, um, but we're gonna monitor it closely and we're just gonna hope that uh, our region just continues to be spared from uh, a large scale uh, infection rate. Uh, why weren't parents given the option to decide how schools were open? I think I mentioned before, but perspectives from many different stakeholder groups were certainly considered in these decisions. Um, all of those things that I've mentioned, your, your, the parent question and answer uh, document that you, you all sent uh, questions to me, of course that was before the state guidance came out. So, um, you know, that answered a lot of those questions for us, but our parent surveys, you know, they showed that the majority of, of our respondents were not in favor of, of a full in-person opening uh, and wanted choice and we've, we've provided those options for you. Um, so those learning remotely and teaching remotely, uh, all of those things uh, need to and have and will continue to be considered. I know that our Department of Health uh, is concerned about any large scale contact tracing that they might have to um, undertake. So again, uh, all of those things and more uh, informed this uh, very important decision that I know is very difficult uh, for many of you. It's certainly not the decision that I think any of us in the district wanted to uh, wanted this to be our option, but uh, under the circumstances, it was certainly made in the best interest of the health and safety of all involved. Will teachers be required to be in the buildings in September? You know, as I'd mentioned before, that there, there are faculty and staff members with underlying health conditions and comorbid morbidities that may increase uh, the impact of contracting COVID-19, uh, or they may fall, care for someone who falls into the vulnerable classification. Uh, and under the state guidance, they can, as I mentioned again, uh, can apply for a re, uh, an accommodation to teach remotely. However, and for a number of reasons, teachers are not gonna be required to be in our buildings all the time. Many will, and this is, this is on me, but back in March, um, when the governor said you need to reduce your uh, occupancy in terms of um, faculty and staff by 50%, look, we just didn't really know enough and uh, I didn't want to take that chance, so I, we just sent everyone home. Um, and that, for, for many folks, was problematic. So in this particular case, our buildings will be open for our faculty and staff members. And um, they can come in, their resources are there. Uh, however, there are those that will, um, you know, work from home for a number of reasons. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes when we, transition to hybrid, um, you know, obviously those who, um, you know, do not present doctor's notes, the expectation is, is that we're, we're working again. Uh, will there be a parent night? Uh, I'm sorry, oh, how will specials be taught? Okay, daily schedules based on uh, development, developmental levels are being discussed, but we are not looking to uh, alter our uh, 
our schedule at all. We're really going to try and provide our students with uh, everything that they signed up for last spring. Uh, so we're not looking to change any of that. Parent night and orientation for incoming freshmen, uh, Friday, August 28th at 1 p.m. Um, every link crew, uh, or, uh, even in the middle school. Uh, Tom, I know you're on here, Mr. Molay. Uh, this is fairly specific to the high school, but um, Tom is working on, Mr. Molay is working on something pretty special. All right, if the decision is made to reopen in October, will we see a five day per week uh, schedule? The transition plan that we um, put out for parents uh, already has that established that we are going to um, be opening in a hybrid situation uh, in October. It is a five day schedule, uh, but it's not a five day in person schedule. Uh, our students are going to be uh, in person two days a week and, and learning remotely from uh, for three days a week. Um, and those, again, those students who may have underlying health conditions uh, who, or who are just not comfortable coming back are going to remain in remote learning uh, five days a week. Uh, what will the school look, uh, day look like? Um, as I mentioned previously, our students are going to follow a daily schedule. Um, and again, the details are uh, still ongoing. We're uh, holding many, many meetings to kind of iron this out, but um, student schedules are going to be either mailed uh, shortly to them or uh, presented at their scheduled material pickup date. Will Regents exams take place in January and June? We're just not sure yet. Uh, no official word on this. Um, I would imagine that they are taking somewhat of a wait and see uh, type of approach. Um, again, that one doesn't apply to the six through eight, but since some of you will, um, you know, some of you do have students in the 912 environment, uh, how will OHS facilitate the college process? Our school counselors are going to communicate virtually with their students. Ideally, no one should skip a beat when it comes to uh, the college process and working with our uh, school counselors. Um, question, I have a child that is usually a great student. He is refusing to participate uh, in the Zoom environment. What can I do? I would absolutely encourage you to please reach out to your child's teacher. Um, you know, they have, um, you know, they, they hopefully will have uh, some ideas. Maybe it's a, a simple conversation with your child. Um, you know, as, as a parent of, of three, I know when, um, you know, when I say something, but yet it comes, or if, you know, it comes from another teacher, kind of takes on a different meeting uh, for uh, my children in particular. So, um, you know, that's something certainly that we can try. Uh, another question, which learning management system will be utilized? It's going to be Schoology, uh, just a one-stop resource for, uh, for our learning management system. Will this daily schedule be mindful of working parents' schedules? We absolutely hope so. Um, again, you know, for structure and um, for, for uh, some degree of uniformity, you know, we are going to uh, essentially provide a virtual nine-day period. We absolutely understand the challenges that, that uh, this creates for parents and guardians. Um, so on paper, it looks like a straightforward day but there is and will be flexibility built in and resources for our families. Um, so hopefully that degree of flexibility will help all of you because we, we know that you're busy and we know that you have to work. Um, and we're hoping that again, partnering with you all in this uh, environment will uh, prove to be as good as it can be under the circumstances. So, Colleen is, has been moderate or will moderate. I, I believe that you've probably typed in some questions. Uh, if not, if you, you know, feel free to click on the Q&A and submit a question and we will try and answer it right now. Okay, take a sip of water, Mr. Brindley, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, here's a question. Why would we allow thousands of college students to return to our community, some areas where the incident of COVID is very high, but not allow our kids to go back to school in person? 
It's a, it's a good question. <clears throat> I will tell you that I have reached out to um, many, many superintendents and communities that um, serve colleges. And um, I will tell you that some of their responses were very concerning to me, but you know, further resort, uh, research indicates that many of them have um, fairly extensive um, and deep departments of health that um, they can clearly accommodate what many are fearful may happen. Um, I know in my conversations locally, the, um, the Department of Health, many of our healthcare providers uh, have all um, been very, very supportive of our phased approach, um, at least here in Oneonta. Okay, so this question is about why is K-8 being treated under the same umbrella as high school and college? Other school districts decided to do K-8 in person. Also a good question and, and not one that we did not consider, but I will, I'll share this with you. Um, reaching out to superintendents of comparably sized school districts, uh, one, in, one conversation in particular uh, was interesting to me because they had shared that they can't accommodate a fully in-person opening, so they're going to have to bring their students back K through eight in, in a hybrid environment. So this, this uh, superintendent was sharing with me that um, they are gonna split their classes in half and they're gonna send you know, uh, you know, those extra kids to the high school where they can spread them out. And as this superintendent was telling me this, I, I said, oh, that's, it's very cool. So my question is, who's teaching those kids? And the superintendent looked baffled a little bit and asked me what I meant. And I said, well, if, if your teachers are teaching one half of your kids here, the other half is going up to the, the, to the high school where they can be spread out. Are the high school teachers monitoring those kids and yet trying to teach their students remotely? Who's watching the, all of those kids in, in the high school? Um, and he politely said, I have no idea. I, that's a really good question and I need to think about it. And he was going into a meeting with other superintendents from uh, Cortland and um, Madison County and, and that area, Onondaga. And I said, well, figure that out so you can let me know. Um, but the reality is many of those schools changed their plans as well. Um, some, some can do it, uh, you know, they have less kids and um, more staff, but um, we just could not do that here. Okay, the next question, uh, will the teachers be trained and or certified on how to educate in the remote learning environment? And I can answer that if you'd like. Sure. Um, the, the teachers in our district have been going through trainings all summer. There's been many offer, um, they've been working on curriculum, prioritizing standards, um, learning Schoology, how to best effectively run Zoom meetings, breakout rooms, how to engage their students in that way, how to effectively and efficiently assess students in a virtual environment. Um, and Schoology is hopefully going to be helpful because it's creating a space where everything is in the same place for students and parents so that we're not going to all these different places to find things. Um, and so, yes, they have had, actually the teachers have been working all summer, um, more than I've ever seen before. Um, every day I'm in contact with many, many teachers and we are going to continue to provide those learning opportunities for them and resources as, as we go, because we didn't have this opportunity when March 13th hit and we knew right at the beginning we were gonna have to prepare for, for this. So yes, they have been um, trained. There is no official online teaching certification, um, but there is many, many um, learning opportunities that they've participated in. Um, it says that the remote plan will create an environment with built-in supports. Will there be live direct instruction for core subject areas? Yes, absolutely. Yes, they will. The, the, I mean, that, that's the plan. Um, <clears throat> those, those supports are really, uh, are those situations where um, their class might not be meeting uh, and, you know, they have a question or you may have a question as a parent um, so those are the supports that we're, we're referring to there. 
If remote learning will be longer than the original weeks, when will this decision be made? Um, good question. Again, we're going to be monitoring this um, daily, actually. Um, and, you know, it, it will be interesting to see, um, you know, if the decision ultimately is made uh, on the local level, I, I try and share that with you as early as I can. Um, but, you know, the, the first five weeks just seem like a natural <clears throat> place to transition. Uh, it's midway through the first quarter. Um, we should have an idea uh, what, if any, type of uh, impact the influx of um, several thousand students may have on, our, on the collective health of our community. But, um, you know, there, again, there are a lot of plates in the air that will, um, you know, need to be managed in order for us to um, exactly determine uh, and define how we're going to uh, transition to a hybrid. But, you know, I will, I will share that information as soon as, um, as soon as humanly possible. Okay. Um, is there a way that parents get a notice of each Zoom meeting from day to day, like a regular scheduled school day? And I can answer that one if you yeah, want. Sure. Um, so everybody, that, that's where Schoology is going to be helpful once parents learn, and we will be providing um, trainings for parents and resources for parents on how you can get logged into school G and see exactly what your child's seeing and teachers will be posting their zoom links in Schoology or on some other schedule that they choose but yes you will be able to see when all those zoom times are are being offered uh, next question i'm scared that i'm going to um i'm not going to catch all class zooms i have three how do we not miss and get we don't want our children to get in trouble <laughs> Listen, this really goes back to what we said before. Um, you know, there, there are occasions when, when your, your children are not going to be able to um, be online. You know, some families, you know, have um, several kids and their uh, Wi-Fi might not support all three being on at the same time. We completely understand that. And we just encourage you to reach out to... Um, your children's teachers in those uh, situations. Uh, there will be occasions when, you know, your child will do something, an assignment and submit that, and that will uh, uh, be enough to account for attendance for the day. And, um, but no, your, your, your children are not gonna get in, in trouble. Uh, flexibility has to be the name of the game here, um, but we also, need to provide a degree of structure um, so that, uh, you know, the instruction is, is, is meaningful this way. When we do transition back into the brick and mortar buildings, you know, hopefully that transition will be relatively easy because it'll be a schedule that our students all are already accustomed to and, and have acclimated to. Uh, so we're hoping that that will, will help in that environment. But, but listen, at any point you feel that, that uh, you know, a circumstance is, is taking place where, um, you know, you're, you're concerned that your child may in some way be penalized for something. Uh, I encourage you, again, to reach out to uh, your, your children's teachers, you can reach out to your building administrator, and as always, you can reach out to me. Next question. Will students' Zoom sessions be recorded in case parents need to refer to them to help their child? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, that is the plan. They may not all be recorded, but um, uh, the teachers, many teachers will, will record them. They will upload them uh, again, because we do recognize that, you know, many of our, our kids may not be able to get on right then and there. And as parents, um, you know, you, you want to uh, help your children. So we're going to provide, try to provide as uh, many of those opportunities as we can for you to do just that um, with uploaded Zooms. And um, again, many of the, uh, all of the Schoology stuff will, will be posted that can be accessed at any time. Um, and, you know, there, again, there'll be some non-digital resources that, uh, and materials that will um, be 
provided for your children. You're going to have textbooks in your hands. Um, you know, all of the, uh, the parent resources that uh, ultimately will be uh, online for you. So we're hoping that all of those things will make this as manageable as possible. Will students whose parents decide to continue with distance learning after September 21st be allowed to participate in sports or clubs? Yeah, and, and that's a really good question <clears throat> because, you know, remote learning is different than homeschooling. Uh, you know, homeschooling is when the student is unenrolled uh, from the district and uh, instruction is provided solely uh, by the family or you know, someone who the family chooses to provide that instruction. In, in those cases, um, sports is, is, is not an option. However, remote learning, um, we are, uh, your students are, your children are our students. They're enrolled in our district. And um, yeah, so, so basically short answer, yes. And then I'll, I'll, I'll not drag that out any longer than it has to be. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> Um, our child has special needs. Can we continue to keep him home after the 13th? Yes, indeed. Yes, this is, um, look, this is a, it's a, it's a, it can be a scary time. Um, and if you're more comfortable with your child remaining home after the 13th, again, uh, at some point here, as we get a little closer, we'll, we'll assess that. It might be another parent survey, which I know that you're probably tired of, but they are, they are super important for us because um, we glean a lot of information from those. So it might be in that format, but yes, of course. Actually, I'm really dragging these answers out. I, I, <laughs> well, this one goes along that. with that one. Um, okay. th will there be a doctor's note required for a student to stay home in remote learning beyond the reopening? No. Is that bad? I think that's for everyone's sake. If I just Good job. One syllable answer. If we can open in October, will we have ample PPE to keep teachers and students safe? We will, and that's a good question. Of course, we are asked in the framework, I, I indicate that we are gonna ask that you, uh, as parents provide your, your children with, you know, at least two masks, um, preferably the cloth ones. Um, we currently have a, a few thousand of the um, surgical masks on hand so on the occasion where your, your child might forget his or hers or during the course of the day uh, your child's mask becomes soiled uh, for some reason we, we will have masks on hand but preferably uh, we're hoping that when your children come to school they might have two masks with them um, daily but yes we as of right now we uh, we were forward thinking, we were able to secure masks and face shields um, and uh, a considerable amount of hand sanitizer. Um, so, I, so we're in good shape there. Um, what if prior to October 13th, it is determined that enough students and families will only want remote learning? Could a five day week for other students be a possibility? So you mean if there are, if the majority of our students, uh, families choose to keep children home completely, if that brought our um, numbers down that we could, we could safely accommodate uh, students in a five day in-person environment, I think we would, we would have to, we'd have to look through that a little bit. Um, you know, our, our Wednesdays, uh, in the hybrid environment are gonna be for uh, deep cleaning of um, you know, our common areas. Uh, but I, I think that could be a consideration for sure. Uh, during hybrid model, will middle school students stay in pods or cohorts and teachers rotate? We, we, we are not gonna pod um, our, our students, um, you know, if under the circumstances with uh, reducing the class sizes um, by wearing our masks, uh, we, we feel comfortable that um, our students can uh, rotate between classes. Okay. Um. And if I could just add, you know, our plan has been, you know, certainly uh, reviewed by our Department of Health. It's been submitted to the state 
Um, and, um, you know, they are certainly in favor of our um, plan. This question says, is the format for the middle school the same throughout the district? And I'm assuming that it's about scheduling. Yeah, I mean, yeah. essentially all of our students are gonna follow the, the master schedule um, for the day. Um, but, but yeah, essentially the middle and the high school follow the same daily schedule. Uh, elementary obviously has their own uh, schedule uh, just simply based on the structure of, of their day. It's, it's, a, it's a little different, um, but um, at least uh, 6 through 12 is, is all the same. So there's a couple of questions about if a student, um, you know, one is running a fever because of something else, like maybe menstruation was mentioned, something like that. I think these will be left up to the nurses to determine these things. And then also, do you have to have a COVID test to get back into school? Right, right now you do. I mean, if you, if, um, you know, if, if a child is symptomatic in school and gets sent home with COVID consistent symptoms, um, yes, that, that, and of course this can all change, but that is uh, based on the guidance from the state uh, that, um, and I think I've provided a, a link for all of you to that 145 page uh, state guidance. Um, you know, our, our reopening framework, a lot of those kind of procedural things were taken right from there. How are the bathrooms going to be monitored and or cleaned during the hybrid model between and during classes? Well, all of those spaces are um, essentially going to have a maximum occupancy on them. Um, many of our bathrooms, when our students return to um, school, have been reconfigured. But in the middle school, um, the um, bathrooms will you know, have, have a mac maximum occupancy on there. Um, so it will take a degree of uh, monitoring and, um, you know, and that will come in the form of education too. You know, it's gonna be incumbent upon us to you know, educate our students, um, you know, that if, if, you're, if you need the, the restroom and it's occupied, you know, maybe you wait at the door just for a minute uh, until someone comes out. And um, again, it's gonna, then it's going to be incumbent upon me to reach out to our teachers, and, and Mr. Malay will, will do a great job as this as well with this as well, letting our teachers know that you know what under the circumstances there may be a couple of kids running late to your, you know to your class, and, and it's probably because they were waiting uh, patiently to use the restroom, uh, so they didn't um, encroach on anyone else's uh, physically physical distance uh, stipulation. So um, we're gonna we're gonna again it's all about uh, education and communication, and we will do that with our teachers and our students. Can you just clarify if someone is sent home and they have siblings in different schools, for example, the middle school and maybe Springbrook and another elementary school, do all siblings get sent home? Again, it's a good question. And, um, you know, what, what, the way we understand it now is the answer would be yes. Um, the, I'm guessing that, you know, if we learn that, you know, this student who's in the middle school is, is heading home, but has a sibling uh, in an elementary building, a sibling in uh, Springbrook, that we will need to reach out to them as well uh, and share that information with them. Uh, just like if there was a sibling in the high school, uh, we would have to reach out to them too. So the answer, again, I, I know I'll shut up, it's way too long, but the answer is yes. <laughs> If students wear glasses, will they be allowed to wear a face shield instead of a face mask? Unfortunately, no. Um, you know, I, I know the, the CDC and the State Department of Health has been all over on this. Um, Mr. Gracie has been hard at work trying to uh, acquire some clear face masks. As you can imagine, many of our um, students uh, their mouths need to be visible so the teachers can see that our students are, are mouthing words correctly. Um, but unfortunately, face shields have, uh, are not considered uh, an acceptable uh, face mask, uh, and therefore, uh, they're going to need to be of the cloth variety or uh, one of the surgical masks. 
if a child or an adult in my child's class is sent home with symptoms, will I be informed? You know, we will, you know, we are going to work uh, in conjunction and collaboratively with the Department of Health. Um, the way uh, it, that was explained to me is that it may be a case by case um, situation, but yeah, you're, you're going to be uh, informed if they um, say, look, you know, that's, that's actually, I don't know. I don't know what that metric is going to be. I don't know if it's going to be, you know, they have this symptom and that symptom. Yes, you need to uh, inform folks. Uh, and on that one, another one is, will the rest of the class be screened? Or if there was someone in a class that was sent home? No, no. And of course, we will follow the lead of the Department of Health. Uh, again, this has been kind of bantered about uh, between them as well. But, um, you know, what we've included in our framework is, is where, you know, the state has landed at this point. That's always subject to change. We're always going to err on the side of caution, uh, but we still have an obligation to maintain the privacy of our students. Um, and um, so we will, we will certainly follow the lead of our Department of Health. Uh, will middle school grades continue to be more heavily based on effort and participation as they were in the spring during remote learning? Well, you know, grading is, is, an, is another conversation that, um, you know, is, uh, is underway uh, and will continue. Um, so I guess more to come on that. Um, Mr. Molay would like to speak about this, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, Tom, just go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So I think the conversation um, will have to start uh, between myself and my, my team of teachers at the Oneonta Middle School. And, um, you know, I, I believe that we should very much take a look at effort and participation. Certainly, we know we're going to have to weigh in our assessments, our quizzes and our tests. But, um, you know, we've, we've got a lot ahead of us, and I, I, I do very much feel that effort and participation should be um, heavily accounted for. Um, how much? I'm not sure just yet, but uh, I, I hope that answers the question. Yes, effort and participate, very important. You know, if you're showing up and, you, and you're working hard, uh, we'll take care of We should be taking care of you. Thank you. In the event that we do not open in October, will we be remote learning for the rest of the year or will we be continually reassessing the situation? We are going to continually reassess the situation. Um, um, and when, you know, if that is the, the scenario, um, which I hope it's not, but if it is, uh, and as we, you know, continually monitor and reassess the situation, um, you know, as soon as there is an opportunity for us to get back into our buildings for for those of you who are comfortable uh sending your children back we're going to try and do so um okay will changes to classes and schedules still be allowed even in the virtual setting will there be deadlines to do so yeah we're gonna i mean we're gonna try and, and he, adhere to um you know those kinds of dates that we have built in um, just because it's just it's just better for the learning environment um, so and, and that's subject to change too I guess that you needs to be discussed a little further my, my inclination would be to um, try and adhere to those dates as best as possible will AIS services still be available Yes, absolutely. Again, you know, the only thing that's really not going to be available per se is study hall. Um, uh, and th those will be opportunities for our students to um, get their eyes off of the screen, you know, grab something to eat. Um, but uh, yes, those, those opportunities are still going to uh, be available for our students. Um, this, you kind of answered this, but what happens if a teacher shows symptoms? Will there be a substitute or does the whole class have to quarantine? You know, my, recently um, the Department of Health participated in a superintendent Zoom for ONC BOCES and um, obviously this is one of the questions that continues to be discussed, but 
there's a series of, of questions that they're going to ask us, and, and it has to do with close proximity. And we're actually putting together, um, you know, somewhat of a, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a symptom playbook for our nurses um, that, uh, you know, these are the questions that are going to be asked. And basically the way I understand it is if, if that teacher um, was in close proximity to two of those students, um, those students might not necessarily have to go home, but a phone call will come home just saying, you know, this teacher uh, was sent home, uh, who, who is symptomatic. Uh, therefore, if you could, please just pay particular attention to your, to your, your child um, and monitor him or her closely. Of course, the Department of Health may suggest that, uh, you know, those, those two students who were in close proximity to that teacher um, be asked to remain home for a period of time. So I guess basically much of that is going to be on a, on a uh, case by case basis. Okay. Um, will there be any discussions about schedules and if schedules change? Yeah, we've already done that. Um, so I think you've talked about this too, but it's another, there's a couple more questions about how will we be addressing the fact that some parents have to work all day and they won't be able to help their kids until the evening. So what kinds of things are we putting in place to help um, in that kind of situation? Yeah, you know, what we're going to try and do is, is make, um, you know, as, as, as many materials accessible to you, um, for you to access as, as possible. And again, you know, on those occasions when, when clearly your child can't be online, please just reach out to your child's teacher. Um, because then, then he or she won't be expecting your child to Zoom that particular day. Um, and, you know, we, we will know that they're going to be working with you uh, later in that uh, evening on that particular occasion. But um, again, we're going to uh, Mrs. Nobling has done a great job, you know, providing and, and will continue to provide some parent resources and um, uh, Colleen as well. And, you know, just by posting uh, some of those things for you to access at, at, a, at a later time, hopefully will create the flexibility and support that you need uh, to do all of that when you, when you can do it uh, after dinner or, or whenever that is to work with your children. Uh... And just a note about the parent resources, those parent resources that we're putting on the website, it's not live yet. We're really working hard to make sure it's just right. So if you go there and you're like, what are they talking about? They're not quite there yet. So we are working on those this week. Um, and if my child is sick and couldn't attend the class virtually, do I still call the school nurse and inform them? Yes, please. Yes, the um, health department has asked us to the best of our ability and, and just so you know, they do this every flu season as well. Uh, they ask us to really um, monitor absences and uh, kind of, uh, you know, document uh, absences that uh, are consistent with flu-like symptoms. Um, when the season is in full swing, sometimes our nurses have to report that to the uh, Department of Health. And although they haven't established that kind of process just yet, I would imagine that it'll be something very similar. So yes, please call uh, if your child is not feeling well and uh, reach out to the health office and let them know. Okay. There was something in the PowerPoint presentation, I was just looking for it, but you probably know, Tom, a meeting was mentioned that is scheduled for Friday, August 28th. Was that the freshman? Yeah. Um, was, okay. You know what, I, I kind of, uh, passed over that in reality, again, I, sh I shouldn't have because you as parents have kids that, uh, you know, may be incoming freshmen in the high school. But on August 28th in, in the high school, there is a, a great group of students that are um, link crew leaders and they facilitate uh, our, our freshman orientation. And on the 28th, those uh, link crew leaders are going to be reaching out to um, their students, roughly seven to 10 students each. And um, they will serve as a good resource too. They really try to help kids transition to the high school and kind of be a resource for them all throughout the school year. 
Um, so on the 28th, I believe at 1 p.m., those Link Crew students are gonna be reaching out to uh, their incoming freshmen. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that's in a Zoom environment as well, but I could be wrong. And, and I was gonna ask Mr. Molay to talk about the sixth grade orientation a little bit. Sure thing. So letters should have already been ma mailed out uh, to anyone uh, with a child in sixth grade. You should have this information. If you don't, please email me and I will send it out immediately. Um, the 25th Tuesday, next Tuesday, uh, for sixth grade only, sixth grade only, will be coming to the school to collect their Chromebooks from four to six o'clock. We wanted to get Chromebooks in the hands of our sixth graders so that they would have something for their orientation the following day, which is the 26th next Wednesday. There are three different sessions. Um, I believe it's 8, 11, and a 1.30, um, but I can split my school. I'll, I'll post that to the chat with exact times. Um, so that's for sixth grade only. Uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders will have materials and Chromebook pickup on September 3rd, okay? Now I've gotten a, lot, a handful of emails from folks saying that they're going to be out of town, they're going to miss the Chromebook pickup or they miss the materials pickup. That's okay. That's not a problem at all. We'll figure it out. I've already got quite a few people coming in on the 27th to pick up their devices. Unfortunately, I can't get materials to you earlier than that because I don't have uh, staff in until the second and third to gather those materials but I've already set up some separate meetings with folks that are gonna come in right after that. Please don't stress that out. Uh, send me an email. If you miss one of the dates, you miss a date, we'll figure it out. We'll get, we'll get the stuff to you, no problem. And again, please send me an email if you didn't get any of those mailings. Thanks, Mr. Molay. Um, there's, this is a question. Um, are there ways parents can help you above and beyond the usual? Oh, I, I have to tell you that you, you, you already help us. Um, you know, your support and partnership in this has been uh, truly um, appreciated. <clears throat> I, I know I keep saying this, but uh, this is a pretty special community. Um, this pandemic has given me the opportunity to uh, truly uh, immerse myself in the um, the ways of other school districts. And um, I've said it before, there are occasions and meetings that I leave. I, I just want to come back and, uh, you know, like, uh, thank everyone who uh, is in our district because uh, it, it is a good team that we have here. Uh, our parents, our students, our faculty and staff, our board. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and vice versa, you know that uh, in many of my um, correspondences to you. Uh, I've included my email and my cell phone. I hope that uh, you, you know you continue to reach out if, if need be. So. Okay. Um, if we continue to request remote learning for our child beyond reopening, do you envision our children zooming into the live classes each day or two days a week? Would they still follow a schedule within that hybrid group? Would that be their hybrid group? Colleen, I have to apologize, but something happened to the audio when you were introducing that. Oh, okay. Basically, it's if we're going to continue to request, can you hear me now? Yep. Remote learning for our children beyond the reopening, how will those children at home be able to zoom into the live classes each day? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Um, we will post the September 3rd pickup materials in the chat. Can you, it says, can you post the September 3rd materials pickup times in the chat? Um, that's also on our district website calendar in case you don't catch that in the chat. Just go right to our, our, our calendar. It's there as well. Um, okay, let's see here. Sorry, I'm just trying to go through and not be redundant. So this question is, if our students are required to be in Zooms for a certain amount of time, then do work for a particular amount of time, how much time will the students be expected to work outside the Zoom sessions? Will there be limits or time parameters for the amount of time students should be doing schoolwork a week outside of Zooms? 
you know, I think, you know, under the circumstances, <clears throat> again, we're going to try and, um, you know, take into consideration all of the factors that will play uh, into this remote learning environment. Um, one of the things, again, that we learned quickly last year, because when, when this all started, you know, everyone was, was truly trying to accommodate their students, but parents reached out to me, as did some students, and said, you know what, I feel like, you know, our children are being, you know, my child is being overburdened. And that was important information because we did change things. Um, and I, I don't have a good answer for your question, but I will say this. Uh, you folks are there with your children. If for some reason you um, feel as though it's too much or too little, again, I just encourage you to reach out to your child's teacher. Um, it's, this is really, uh, there's, there's no, there's no playbook for this. It's, um, you know, much of it is, is learning as we go. Uh, you know, for some kids, they can, um, you know, they, they can almost become uh, over, overwhelmed with uh, some of the work, and that's not what we want. So in terms of how you can help as, as parents, you can absolutely be that kind of barometer for us. And, you know, if you're finding that, um, you know, this is uh, becoming that type of environment for your children, uh, I would strongly encourage you again, just reach out to your child's teacher and, and let him or her know. And I just add one little thing. It's just like regular school, you know, like you do a little work in school and then you do some at home and we're hoping that it would be like, you know, a little more like that. So just again, communication, here we go. What metric, I don't know, Tom, Mr. Brinley, if you have this, you're, what metric would potentially not be a problem if under 5%? Well, you know, if if um, <clears throat> if if we're under five percent, and I truly hope we are, and um, you know, the Department of Health has uh, said that they can, uh, they are. Look, five weeks from now, we're going to have a good idea of, um, you know, where we stand uh, from the um, uh, healthcare community in terms of cases locally. So, if we're under five percent, if um, you know, we have a, 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 a strong substitute pool that we can, um, you know, have on hand if we have uh, teachers that are um, requesting that work from home accommodation, if our uh, bus drivers are healthy, you know, if, if our um, food supply is still strong, all those things, as I mentioned before, we're going to try and get our kids back into our brick and mortar buildings as quickly as we can. So um, as always, all of those things are gonna continue to be monitored closely. Um, so. All right, uh, so I, th I think that's about it. There was one other question that is in the, the chat that says something about, um, it doesn't seem like it will be that much different maybe when we get closer to October date. Um, what, what what plans do we have? And I think you already answered that. We're just going to be, you know, taking it as it comes and getting guidance. Um, but if you want to talk about that, that was the only question that was left. Yeah, we are, we're absolutely going to do all of that. Um, again, I, we're, we're lucky to um, maintain a real collaborative relationship with the Department of Health. And, um, you know, we're just going to be keeping our eye on all of those things. Um, and Hopefully at that point, the decision will be easy to make. Um, that being said, for the last year, there hasn't been an easy decision uh, that has presented itself to us at all. So, um, but I'm hoping that's gonna change and I'm optimistic it, it will, but uh, more than anything, I would love if, if the, uh, you know, the health of this community uh, was in a position that we could just uh, get, get back to where we, where we wanna be where we should be. No one gets into this profession to, to conduct school like this. Um, and we do recognize the important role that schools play in, in, in this community, in every community. And we want to be that for you as parents and guardians as well. Um, 
and and it is tremendously unfortunate that we all find ourselves in this situation again. Um, but boy, I, I, I don't ever want to wish time away, but I, I know you feel the same way as well. Can't wait for this to uh, be behind us. And a um, couple more questions here. Uh, so this one says, and you have touched upon this a little bit, but that we have real concerns as full, two full-time working parents who will have to leave their sixth grader home alone and hope that he can keep up with the work. How do you see this having positive outcomes and what kind of support is available for us when we come home at 530 and have to figure out what our son has to do? And I think you answered that, but if you want to just go ahead and speak to it. I... Yeah, and, and again, you know, we learned a lot from March to, through June. Um, and, you know, we clearly uh, learned that we need to provide more support for our parents. And, um, my, my hope is that, um, you know, let's say, for example, we are able to mobilize our student tutors, that they might fill that gap a little bit um, for questions that your, your, your child might have, for questions that you might have as parents. Uh, you know, we're hoping that, you know, the resources that we put uh, and make available for you online will fill those gaps. And when struggles pop up that, you know, you're finding this difficult again. And I know I'm, I'm saying this too much, but we want to be, we want to partner with you. So, you know, when those struggles um, arise, just reach out to, reach out to us. And um, we're going to try and problem solve it together. Um, again, I don't have a great answer for you. I know this is tremendously challenging as as working parents, you go to work all day um, and, you know, you leave your middle school child home. That's why we are hoping that by creating um, and, and following a nine period schedule, that hopefully you will, you will find some comfort in knowing that uh, your, your child is, is um, as engaged as possible during that time uh, and that someone, you know, even in the virtual environment will have uh, eyes on them for a, you know, a period of time each day. Um, so yeah, clearly we, we absolutely get the challenges that uh, many of you are facing. And, and, and I, you have to understand schools are microcosms of our communities. And you know, many of our teachers are parents you know, as well. And, it's, and you know, they will fall into the same category um, too. You know, they'll they'll uh, teach all day and you know, they'll return home and, and continue to teach their children at night and um, just can't wait till we can do all that teaching during the school day. And, uh, and of course, the teaching at home never stops, but uh, to get the bulk of it when it's supposed to be during the school day will be great at some point again. Question. Um, with our region in the Mohawk region and there being 10 colleges in this region, will reopen after October 9th and not closing be based on Mohawk region's numbers or our county's numbers? Well, you know, it's a really good question because, you know, when um, we had heard that the governor was going to make some sort of announcement um, on, on a, a regional basis, um, you know, at the time, Madison County had all sorts of um, uh, spikes happening, but our, our reopening really is going to be based on um, input from our Otsego and Delaware County Departments of Health. As you know, our district spans both counties. Uh, a little bit of our district lives in Delaware County. Um, so, uh, and I know I've said Otsego County um, 433 times tonight, but it's really Otsego and Delaware County. We, um, Mandy over in Delaware County, we have a great working relationship with her as well. And um, you know, if we are put in a position where uh, we have to close locally, uh, that will be based on input from our uh, departments of health. Okay, thank you. Will attendance be taken each period? Will we get notifications of absences from periods like we had in the past in person from attendance office and phone calls if they're absent in the morning like in the past? Yeah, so that's a very good question. 
And um, the, the answer is yes. And that's why it's important if, for example, you know that, you know, let's say third period, um, you know, your child isn't going to be able to be online just to let the, the teacher know. But I would encourage all of you, if you are not already uh, signed up for the eSchool Parent Access Center, um, which is a great resource. You know, your, your children's grades are contained in there. Their daily attendance is in there. Uh, their discipline is in there. Um, but uh, yeah, our, our, we're, we're hoping to operate just like we would in the uh, in-person environment, but um, would, would certainly uh, encourage you to all sign up for um, uh, eSchool Parent Access as, as that is a really good resource relative to attendance and discipline and, and grades and those kinds of things. And we'll be sending home, if you're not already signed up, a little t tutorial on how to do that. It's, it's pretty easy to sign up for that. Mr. Molay, do you wanna to speak to this save the date thing? Um, save the date that says orientation on the 25th, not Chromebook the, pickup. The, the, 20, the 25th, originally we were going to do, we didn't know if we were gonna do orientation in 25th or 26th, we were kind of waiting to see if we were going to be remote or in person. Certainly we didn't want to do a virtual orientation if we were going to be in person in September. And likewise, if we were going to be virtual in September, it would be, it would be obviously appropriate to do a virtual uh, orientation. Uh, so we, we tried to get a jump on things because we hadn't sent anything out. So we sent save the date postcards. Hindsight 2020, I think uh, the postcards, they're absolutely a great idea and I would do it again, but I would probably um, a company a postcard with an email or at least an all call just kind of clarifying you know the, the idea was to get the postcard out there to kind of let folks put something on the calendar put something on the refrigerator um, and I think we did confuse a couple people so I apologize about that August 25th is sixth grade Chromebook distribution 20 26th the following day Wednesday is their virtual orientation and again about that orientation um, I'll work with Mr. Brindley and, and other, other officials at the district, but I very much do want to try to get our sixth graders back in that building um, sooner than the general population, because I know they've probably got butterflies in their stomachs and parents, I know you do too. I'd love to get them in the building um, to get used to it, to walk around to meet their teachers, to try to figure that out. So we have the virtual orientation the 26th, yes, but it will not be the last time we, we um, work with our new sixth graders. Very excited to have them. Can't wait to get, I can't wait to get them all back in the building. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Brindley, I think, I think that's it. Those are all the questions. Oh, wait. Oh, thank you. Mr. Ionelli says thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> well, I can't thank you all enough for, um, you know, spending these almost two hours with us this evening. And uh, again, we certainly appreciate the challenges that this all uh, this whole uh, virus has created in our lives. And, you know, I hope you all know as parents and guardians that, um, you know, the safety and uh, education of your children are, are so important to us all. And we're going to try and do what we can to make this as um, manageable uh, for you all and, um, and, as, and as safe as it can be. And as always, we just really do appreciate all that you do as not only our, our, our students' parents, but as community members, um, you know, recognizing that many of you are essential workers, um, certainly create, uh, appreciate your contribution to this community. Uh, as always, you know, feel free to reach out with any questions that you, you might have or concerns or comments. Um, certainly try to uh, get back to you as, as quickly as I can. And uh, until, you know, we're, we're together sitting at the uh, OMS Live or uh, at a basketball game in the middle school gym or um, something along those lines. Just wish you all well and continued safety and uh, to you and your families. And I thank all of our panelists for being here tonight. Certainly appreciate that as well. And uh, we just wish you all well. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.